I want to talk about one of my favorite topics in all of science, especially all of physics, relativity. Relativity is Einstein's glorious unification of the concepts of space and time into one beautiful structure that gives us all sorts of amazing insight into how the universe works. And to study that, a lot of times that seems like a daunting prospect. There's a lot of math that goes into it, there's a lot to learn. It's my belief that we can understand a great deal about science and about concepts in science uh, without delving into complicated equations if we can find a way of presenting information in a visually meaningful way. And to that end, I'm going to talk today about discussing relativity using a concept called space-time diagrams, and in particular space-time diagrams with the help of a fancy type of weird graph paper, this hyperbola graph paper developed by my colleague Tom Moore at Pomona College. Uh, I'll talk about that for a while, but before I get to all the weird curving lines on here, pretend those are gone, just think it's ordinary graph paper, let me tell you what a space-time diagram does, what it's all about. The key aspects are that there are two axes, there's time vertically on the diagram, going up on the diagram goes to later times, and there's space horizontally on the diagram. Now, these diagrams are representing motion in just one dimension of space, forward and backward, along a single line. So these diagrams won't have anything where you're turning corners and going in circles. They may have something going back and forth, but it's going to be one-dimensional motion that it captures. Still, that's enough to understand the basics of relativity and a lot of the core ideas that people talk about when they, when, when they find out all the cool things that relativity has to teach them. So we're going to do this diagram. Uh, one of the things we're always going to do when we draw these space-time diagrams for consistency of, of uh, the math and, and making the diagrams useful for not just visualizing a story, but for doing calculations, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to mark off time in, let's say, years, and we're going to mark position, space, in light years, the distance that light travels in one year. So we're using compatible units that way that are related by light's travel. Uh, if, I mentioned, if I measured this in seconds upward, then I'd measure space in light seconds. Uh, notice, by the way, that time going up and space horizontally is the opposite of the way that graphs typically go in uh, a math class or something, or even basic physics classes. It's a little weird, but this is the tradition in studying relativity, and it turns out to be really useful for visualizing horizontal motion because you can just, you know, the, if you're moving forward and back, that corresponds to forward and backward motion here. Upward motion on the graph means pat traveling forward in time. So, uh, key idea in terms of traveling forward in time, is that as we go here, as we travel forward in time, things are going to move from one position to another, and how quickly they move sideways will tell you something about their speed. For example, light. I just said that we're measuring vertical units in years, horizontal units in light years. That means that light, if, it's been, if, it travels, if you have light that starts at the origin and it travels for one year, it will have gone one light year. Two years, two light years. Three years, three light years and it will always go at a 45 degree angle. Uh, I put this down here. The speed of light, lowercase c, is equal to one light year per year, sort of by definition. And on our diagrams, we're setting them up so that it's always 45 degrees. That turns out to be useful and important. Now, it might be 45 degrees this way if the light is moving in the positive direction. It might be 45 degrees this way if the light's moving in the negative direction, but it'll always be 45 degrees. That's one of the key things in relativity, that every observer agrees on the speed of light. Light rays will always move 45 degrees, no matter who emitted them or how. Okay, so that's these diagrams. Now, let me show you how you visualize someone's motion on one of these diagrams. Uh, let's imagine that this diagram is being drawn by Alice. Alice considers herself to be at rest, and she's defined herself to be at her own x equals zero position. Alice, on this diagram, then, is going to sit around for some unknown time, for years and years, staying at basically the same place, and time's going to pass, but she will always be at x equals zero. That means that Alice's path on this diagram never changes left and right. It's always the same. Alice's path, someone sitting still, goes straight up on the diagram. That's Alice's path, someone sitting still. On the other hand, Zach has a velocity of two-thirds light years per year, two-thirds times the speed of light, two-thirds c. Uh, if that's Zach's velocity, what that means is that every time, if Zach starts at the origin, we'll assume that Zach starts at the origin as well. If Zach travels for three years, he will have moved two light years over. That's two-thirds light years per year, two light years every three years. Three more years, two more light years, three more years, two more light years. You get the idea of how that works. I can draw Zach's path on this diagram. 
let me let me do that just to get that up here. And again, I'm going to start Zach at the origin because that's that's what we're always going to to use the to use the features of this special graph paper, uh, which we'll talk about later. We want to have lines passing through the origin. So Zach is going to pass Alice at the origin, and let's see, two thirds light years per year means after 12 years, Zach will have gone eight uh, eight light years. So let me draw that just a second. I want to be fairly careful with my line because I want to get this as close to right as I can. Uh, wait, where am I? Mm, we'll see how this goes. Try to draw this right. Pretty close, I hope. I hope. Okay, and I guess Zach could have been going back here too. Okay, there is Zach's path on this diagram. I hope you can see it. This is this is a velocity equals two-thirds the speed of light, two-thirds c path on the diagram. And in that path, you can see it's tilted over compared to Alice's path, which is vertical. One of the features of this diagram that you can remember is that as someone goes slower and slower, their path on the diagram is steeper. As they go faster, their path gets flatter. So faster, 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 flatter, flatter. Slower, slower, steeper, steeper, and uh, one thing to keep in mind, if you've learned any relativity, you may have heard that nothing can go faster than light. What that means is, as you go flatter and faster for faster and faster motion, you get closer and closer to 45 degrees, but you never quite get to 45 degrees. You're never quite there. That's how these diagrams work. Okay, so thus far we've talked about uh, the way we draw this, and we can compare Alice's path to Zach's path. Fine. Uh, but I haven't said anything about why this is complicated graph paper, why I have all these curving lines on there. And for that, I have to tell you a little bit about the structure of relativity. I can't get away with that. So uh, let's come over. Uh, relativity, there are lots of ways of working with it, lots of ways of doing the equations. But fundamentally, one of the, on some level, the core concept of relativity is finding the invariance. So many things are relative to which observer you are, relative to your perspective. But there are some invariants that are the same for everyone. And the key invariant for space-time diagrams is what's called the space-time interval. If you, if, if you have a, a reference frame, an inertial reference frame, I'm not going to define everything here. I'm to, I hope you've learned some relativity before, uh, some of the concepts. This is just talking about the diagrams. If you have an inertial reference frame, a bunch of clocks, synchronized clocks moving together, all at rest relative to one another, and you have two events, an initial event and a final event, Let's say, for example, the event where Zach passes Alice. That's an event. It's at as a specific time in a specific position. An event is always a point on a space-time diagram. And let's say we have a final event. Let's say the event where Alice believes that Zach has been traveling for 10 years. There's a final event up there. If I want to know, uh, if, if I can measure the difference in time between those two events, it must be 10 years, that's what I said it was, I can measure the difference in position, delta x, between those events. And that would be whatever this difference in position is, something six and two-thirds years. So I can measure the change in time, change in x. Different observers are going to disagree, it turns out, on how much time has passed between two events and on how much position difference there is between two events. That's very observer-dependent. That that's, depends on the reference frame we're in. But the beautiful thing is that this combination, time, time, the time interval squared minus the distance interval squared with a factor of the speed of light to get the units the same, delta t squared minus 1 over c delta x quantity squared, that difference gives us the space-time interval squared, delta s squared. And the space-time interval is something that every observer will agree on. For the same, if you have two events and the observers agree on the two events, then that space-time interval is something every observer will agree upon. It's cool that that's true. This looks a bit like a Pythagorean theorem, but it's not because there's a minus instead of a plus in the middle. And if you think about what that does, I don't know, you know if you've learned some geometry, learned some conic sections or something, you may recognize that if this were a delta t squared plus whatever c delta x squared, that would be the equation for a circle or an ellipse. But if you've got a minus in the middle, that's an equation for a curve called a hyperbola. A hyperbola, y squared minus x squared equals constant, gives these hyperbola shapes. And uh, in fact, that's what we have graphed on this graph paper. Uh, you can see, for example, that if delta x is 0, then the delta s squared is exactly the same as delta t squared. And so each step along the way, along our time axis here, what we've done is say, let's draw a hyperbola 
that has, you know, if this is one year of time, let's draw a hyperbola that shows all of the points that all share delta s equals one year. So, uh, you know, I can look at this. If there's, if they're the distance from the origin, this is all, the hyperbolas are all based on comparisons to the origin in a special graph paper. So you can only use these hyperbolas if you've got a line going through the origin. But compared to the origin, the, the, the space-time interval between this point and this point is delta t of one year, delta x of zero, so it's one. But the claim would be that if I went over to, I don't know, this point here, uh, I would have a delta t of four years and uh, a delta x of almost four years, and you'd come out with a hyperbola that, that would still be on this one-year hyperbola because that's another thing where the difference winds up being one year. The delta s that you get from this equation winds up being one year. So these lines are lines of constant, uh, are th these are constant, uh, constant space-time interval curves. That's what's going to make all of our calculations work later on. So th that's the idea. Now, to talk about this well, I, I know that, does, that, that doesn't necessarily seem clear yet why, why this is useful to draw on a paper, but let me show you why this is useful. Uh, first, you may, not, may or may not need to know this. Let me show you really quickly how I could ask a specific question using the math of the space-time interval to ask a question about different observers' experience of time. So uh, here I said, when Alice thinks that Zach has been gone for 10 years, so 10 years have passed after Zach left Alice, parted, passed by Alice, that would be along here, how much time has passed for Zach? Well, I mean, for, for us, we look at this, we say uh, we need to have a difference in time between two events. The first event is clearly when Zach passes Alice. And the second event, when Zach has been gone 10 years, according to Alice, what does that mean? Well, Alice believes that all the, all the events on this line, 10 years later from zero, Alice says all these events are 10 years after Zach passed by. So in particular, Zach is at this position 10 years after he passed by Alice, as measured in Alice's diagram, as measured in Alice's frame. So our second event is this event right here, where Zach is at that 10-year 10 10 year mark as seen by Alice, as measured by Alice. And our question is, how much time has passed on Zach's own watch? How much time would Zach have measured in between? Let's see how we can do that. Well, uh, the first step is going to be to use the space-time interval to answer that question. If I want to do this with math, we'll see how to do it in the diagram in just a minute. But with math to start with, let's see what that looks like. Let's find the space-time interval between those two events. I would say that delta S squared has to equal Alice's measurement of delta T is 10 years, 10 years squared minus 1 over C is 1 year per light year, that's the inverse of the speed of light, times, and what do we say, that Zach's travel, if Zach traveled for 10 years at 2 thirds of the speed of light, uh, distance equals velocity times time, so that's 20 thirds, uh, 6 and 2 thirds, uh, 6 and 2 thirds light years squared. Uh, you can multiply this out, I guess, you know, that's 20 thirds, so 400 over 9 when you square it, uh, uh, be, it's messy. But what we end up finding uh, when you work this out is that this is equal to, if I work on the numbers, I'll just copy it down so you don't have to watch me do math. Um, I get, uh, I get 55 and 5 ninths square years, 55 and 5 ninths, 100 minus 6 times 6 is 62 goes 6 and 2 is about 44.4, so this is 55.555, uh, which by the way is 7.45 years squared. So the space-time interval delta s is that 7.45 years. That's my calculation using of the space-time interval using Alice's calculation. Then I can say, what would Zach have calculated for that same time? Again, this is just using the equations. We'll see how we can skip the equations using the diagram in a minute, but I want to compare the two. If I used equations, I would say that this also has to be equal to delta t as seen by Zach. So I'll do delta tz to means that measure, as measured by Zach. Minus, uh, minus 1 over the speed of light times delta x as seen by Zach squared. 
That's, I'm, that's the same idea. Just as long as the same observer measuring t and x, then we just do this difference. They have to agree. The numbers have to be the same. But here's the fun part. Zach believes that Zach is sitting still. This is a key concept of relativity. And so a, a person who's moving at constant velocity without changing their direction or their speed, that person is going to be moving at you know, moving constant velocity. They're going to feel like they're at rest. From Zach's perspective, Zach is just sitting still in his spaceship or whatever, and the world is whizzing past him. Alice whizzed by him a while ago, and now he's just going, the world is whizzing by. That's equally valid in relativity. Both observers are right. And so when we have this, that means that delta x for Zach, how far does Zach believe that Zach has moved? Zach thinks that Zach is sitting still and the world is passing him by. So this is zero in Zach's own measurements. Delta x Zach is zero. So that tells me that Zach's delta t squared, Zach's measurement of the time interval between the two events, is exactly the space-time interval itself. Uh, that, that's almost a defining feature of that. If you're present at both events and you're an inertial observer, you're measuring space-time interval. So that means that delta t Zach is 7.45 years. That's the result that we come up with using the equations. That wasn't too bad, but I'd rather find a way of doing this without using equations at all. Here's how we can use this hyperbola graph paper to do it. So remember, the hyperbolas mark lines of constant proper time, right? So the hyperbola that passes through t equals 2 on the axis here corresponds to proper time of 2 there. t equals 5, proper time of 5 there, five, 5 years in this case. Uh, we just saw that along Zach's own line, delta x is 0, those hyperbolas will measure Zach's own experience of time. If, he, if the delta s, if you're on the delta s equals 3 years hyperbola, that means that Zach's own measurement of delta t is going to be 3 years. That means we can use the hyperbolas to calibrate Zach's experience of time. Let me show you how that works. I follow Zach's path along, it, along the graph. Every time Zach's path crosses one of these hyperbolas, I put a little mark to calibrate the path. So there's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, there's five, there's six, there's seven, I won't go too far here, uh, here's eight, I'll go, okay fine, I'll go far, nine, so let me label those two. This is, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years. These are all in years because this is the one, two, three, four, five year hyperbolas that we did. Now that I've calibrated, I guess I can calibrate down here too if I really want to. Minus one down here, minus two, and so on, going that way. Now the, the important thing is, now that I've calibrated Zach's experience of time, I'm going to ignore the hyperbolas forevermore. I'm not going to do anything else with hyperbolas. I've calibrated Zach's experience of time, and I'm all set. So now I ask the question, at what time, what time would Zach have measured this event to be? The event that Alice thought was 10 years after Zach had left. What time does Zach measure for that event? Well, I just look at the calibration. It's between the seven and eight year marks on Zach's calibrated path, and in fact, I would go so far as to say that it's almost exactly between the two. I might say, I might have said 7.4. Eh, maybe I would have said 7.5. The point is, I would say that that is halfway between the 7 and 8 year hyperbolas. If I made a bigger and bigger and more and more careful drawing, I'd get a better and better, more and more accurate measurement. Uh, but I'd say it's about 7 and a half years between the 7 and 8 year calibration marks, and that's an exact agreement with this. The beauty of it is, I didn't need to do any math of my own as long as I had this graph paper with the hyperbolas on it. I use the hyperbolas to calibrate the line, and then I can just read off the times of events along the way. Uh, there's more subtleties to it if I do events that aren't on Zach's path, that's much more complicated, but as a starting point, this works. And I love it because I don't need to do anything too mathy to get results about relativity that say, hey, Zach believes that less time has passed than Alex, be than, than Alex believes between those same two events. That's a cool result. That's a neat thing about relativity, and we can get it straight from the picture. I hope that you appreciate that too, and we'll do more examples of different types of calculations with this graph paper as we go on.